Hi, my name is Reverend John Powell, founder and CEO of Truth For You. Once again, I'm excited about being here with you. As we oftentimes say on the radio broadcast on WRNE 980, Choice 106.9, I'm excited about being here. Thankful to Mr. Vernon Watson of the WBQP uh, TV 12. I want to let you know that the words and comments that I make are my own personal comments, and they're not um, by any means... uh, uh, contacted with, associated with uh, this uh, TV station. I want to thank God for Mr. Robert Hill, my good friend of mine as well. He is uh, the owner uh, of uh, WRNE 980, Choice 106.9. wanted to say today that with, with, the, with all that is going on, let me just calm down for a moment and thank God for how good he is to us. Let's start off with a prayer this time. The Heavenly Father, we come before you with bowed heads and humble hearts. We come before you, Lord, as an empty vessel before a full fountain. We ask you, God, to look on those family members that are just coming to visit, Lord, those that are here, Lord. Look on those families that are having problems in their home, Lord. Look on the fathers, Lord, that are not in their home. Look on the mothers that are struggling, trying to make it. Look on the young people that are involved in school activities, Lord. Help them, Lord, to be focused on the school, Lord, and, and be focused, Lord, on getting their studies done, God. And we actually got to touch those, Lord, that are in need of your blessings, Lord, in every way, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being so good to us, Lord. Because, Father, you are the author and the finisher of our faith, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the goodness, Lord, that you have bestowed upon all of us, Lord. We ask you, Father, to touch those ones that are looking out the window, Lord, and trying to figure out what tomorrow is going to bring and whether they're going to get laid off or whether they're going to get promoted or whether someone's going to pass them over, Lord. And those ones that have just tuned in, this is the first time they're tuning into this broadcast, God. We ask you, Lord, to touch them right now, Lord, and bless their spirit, Lord, that they might, Lord, be able, Lord, to pull something from what is being said that it might touch their lives and their hearts, God. We thank you, Father, for the subject today of um, homecoming. Now remember, what time is it? Look at your watch and say, what time is it? You know, do I love the Lord? The Lord has been truly good to me. God has been in the blessing business. Has God blessed you? Do you believe that the Lord will do for you what he said he would? Homecoming, what does homecoming mean to you? What does that word homecoming mean to you? Someone has come home from somewhere. They left home for whatever the reason might be. Maybe they got upset. Maybe they were mad. Maybe they said, I'm going to leave. I ain't never coming back no more. Maybe they went into the military, be it the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard, you know, the Marine Corps, you know, uh, you know, Many different facts. There's five different branches of the service that they can go into. And maybe they entered into one of those branches and they said, uh, and they retired, and they decide they would stay there. And now they're coming on from retirement. Maybe someone, you know, got upset, got in a fight with the family members and said, I'm going to leave. I'm going to New York. I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to California. I'm going to Alabama, Georgia. Memphis, Tennessee, I'm leaving, and I'm never going to come back. But all of a sudden, you got that phone call that says, I want to come home. I'm on my way back home. I got a job offer in Pensacola. I got a job offer to come back home, and I'm coming back home because I want to be around my family. Think about it today. Someone left home for many different reasons. Maybe they didn't feel loved. Maybe they felt like they were number one. They felt like nobody loves me here. All I get is ridicule. I never get any pats on the back or any encouragement. So I'm leaving and going where I can get some pats on the back. Somebody got upset. Said, hey, I'm tired of getting mad. I'm tired of being frustrated. I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of being tired. So I'm leaving. But all of a sudden, we hear that our brother, a sister that was lost, hallelujah, and now they're found, they're on their way back home. 
Can you imagine how the prodigal son's father must have felt? He had two sons. One elected, decided to leave. The other decided to stay home. I'm going to stay in the ark of safety. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go out and explore. The other one decided, I got all these riches and all these treasures, and I want to go out and enjoy myself. And the father of heart was grieved because his son left from that shelter, from that culture, you know, from that, 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 that safe ark of safety. When we're in the arms of Jesus, hallelujah, we're in an area of safety. But he left it. Then all of a sudden the father would go out and look and look and look down the road and say, one of these days, one of these days, my son's coming home. And I'm going to keep a watchful eye in the event that he comes home so I'll be ready. Homecoming. But remember, sometimes things lead to us having, having to leave home because if I don't leave, sometimes, you know, my mom used to say, uh, too many grown folks in the house. You know what that means, don't you? Too many grown folk. I mean that everybody want to do what they want to do. Nobody wants to follow the rules. And, and when you're coming up in the house, you got adults. Usually there's two. Sometimes there's one. But everybody else in the house is supposed to be children. They're supposed to be either teenagers or children living there because they can't take care for, of themselves. So therefore, they, they, can't, they can't afford to pay light bill, water bill, gas bill, and go to the grocery store and buy groceries and then buy their own clothes and, and that kind of, those kind of items. So then they're there they're, they're, they're as dependents on that one soul or two people that are there that are going out and getting involved in the workforce every day and taking care of them. Sometimes we find in the family that it seems like uh, the children are running the family because they tell mama or grandma or, or daddy what to do and to shut up and to hush and be quiet. And I wear what I want to wear type attitude. And we allow them to get away with that. And then they go out thinking that they can tell other folks that same thing. No, other folks are not going to allow you to talk to them in that frame of mind because they view you as being a child. The word of God said, when I was a child, I spec as a child. I understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away all childish things. So when you are a child, there are certain things you need to do. It says train up. Train up don't mean like go fetch this, go get that. It means instruct a child. Train means to instruct a child on what he or she should or should not do so that they don't go out there and, 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 and get injured or get hurt or get their feelings hurt or, or emotionally get set back because somebody's going to put them in their place and say, be quiet. I don't want to hear what you got to say. You are a child. So we sit there and we allow them to speak out of turn and say what they want to say. And some of them, and you'll be surprised what your child is saying when you're not around. I watched some children stand there and just curse and say, okay. and it was just like I wasn't there until I said, excuse me, don't y'all see me here with my gray hair and my mustache and everything? Surely I look my age. I look like I'm an elder. So why are you not respecting me as such? Now, a lot of children have not been taught that, you know, they, they the, the, you sit around there and you cuss around them and you say what you want to say and smoke and drink your alcohol and talk your talk and do your rapping and your this and your that and you call them women this and that and whatever and they hear you say that so they feel like when they're not in your presence they can say it and some of them don't care nothing about your presence. They will say it right there while you're at them. You say, boy, did you hear what you just said? Watch your mouth. No, I don't tell you to watch your mouth. Somebody should have slapped you in your mouth. Say, oh, hey, oh, excuse me. You know, I ain't saying knock their, knock their brains out. I'm saying, let them know, hey, we don't say that. And then sometimes we used to say, I'm going to wash your mouth out with soap. You know, un unfortunately, in my culture, we weren't washing people's mouth out with soap. 
You know, we would say, uh-uh, you don't say that. Or we would get that belt and put a little tightness in the bone. You say, hey, that's not what you said. That is inappropriate language, and you are a child, and children don't say what you're saying. But if you would, if you are constantly involved around people that do that, then you're going to do it. Children mimic us. They are a teenager's are adult in process. They, will, they don't initiate love. They reflect love. If you're hugging and you hugging on everybody, then they hug on people because that's what they see you doing. If you're reluctant to say, oh, oh no, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't hug. You know, we got some men that say, I don't hug. You know, I don't, I don't hug. And I don't show uh, love. I don't show my affections. You know? And some men don't even show their affection to their wives. You know, they don't walk up there and hug them. You know, you know I love you. You know, hey, hey, hey. You know, you act like you're scared. But when you were courting her, when you were chasing her, when, when, when you fell first fell in love with her, you was hugging and kissing her on and everything. Then all of a sudden, now that you 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 have her, you you don't kiss her no more. You don't hug her no more. You don't chase her around the house. You don't say those loving things. You don't bring when there's no anniversary, no nothing. You bring her some flowers or bring some ice cream. And say, hey, we're gonna take a ride down here by the water and look at the water, and then throw the rod and reel in the, in the in the truck or the car and get down there and look and then pull him out and say, we're going to fish a little bit. Even if we don't catch anything, we just want to feel the breeze blowing in our face. And, and think about, when you say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, do you really understand what you're saying? When you look at your wife or your husband and say, when I think of how we got started, See, young people that get married now, they don't see what you see. They see the struggle. They see the tussle. They see the light bill and the water bill. And they're trying to get this car and trying to figure out how we're going to get two cars. But we can't afford but one car and just barely can afford that one car. We got a child and we're trying to put the car seat in, trying to do this at the same time. And, and uh, you need to go to work and I need to go to work. And we're trying to get grandmama or, or auntie, somebody to babysit the child until we can get the child in some type of daycare. But we can't afford daycare daycare because daycare costs too much money. So we're trying to figure out how we're going to make this situation work and at the same time not lose a car, not lose the situation. But you're going to, but in the process of living and trying to make it, you're going to have some, some gains and you're going to have some losses. You're going to have what we call debits and credit. You're going to have some things that you're going to, you're going to think you got a grass hold on to then all of a sudden those things are going to slip out your hand. They're going to just melt in your hand and you're going to say, how did we lose that? You know, you're going to find out that you're going to buy furniture every year, every two or three years, you're going to find yourself buying new furniture because the furniture you buy is not expensive. It's just you're just trying to maintain and look make your house look decent, you know. But but nobody's there at the spoon feed you and tell you that they're going to be ups and downs and whatever. Nobody's there to tell you that your first five years, I said the first five years, five years are going to be troublesome, bothersome. You're going to learn a lot about your partner that you didn't know. There are things that when a person is courting you, they don't reveal to you until all of a sudden you're married and you find out that they're squeezing the toothpaste and they roll it up and they do whatever. Then you say, I wish that they didn't squeeze it like that in, 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 up front and then I got to squeeze from the back. I wish that they didn't leave the toothbrush laying on the counter. I wish they put in something. I wish they didn't leave their combs and brushes and stuff hanging all around. I, you know, I wish that they didn't do this, you know. I, you know I, but, but then as time goes by, you find out that you think you've been bending, but when you get to talking to the person that you love and care about you, you find they've been bending just as much or more than you've been bending. You know, you think, I've been tolerating this. I've been getting along. And you find out that they've been tolerating you. Even in relationship, you find out that, hey, well, you love your mother and your father, but you don't care too much for her mother and father. And then when it comes time for her to go to see them, you say, you make all kinds of excuses. Well, you know, you know. And then, then you'll try to keep her from going. You know, you know, you know, we ain't got to go over there. We've been over there once a week or, you know, once a month, you know. But you're going to see your mama and your dad or your mother every day. But yet when it comes time, but when she wants you to go with her to see her mother, you, well, you make excuses. You, these things you have to, you don't pay much attention to. And they say, well, okay, I'll, I'll go. You ain't got to go. You do what you're doing, you know, whatever. Go and watch your football or whatever. And then you, you, you don't see that there's time and time and time. You keep missing the opportunity to fellowship with her parents or you fellowship with his parents. 
because you don't care nothing for them. You know, and, and a lot of times in relationship when you when you're dating a person, going with them, you you find out that my dad may have high expectations because fathers love their daughters and they don't want you. They really don't want their daughter to get married. Okay, because they feel like well, you're not going to be capable of providing for my daughter, which I provided for, you know, and, and, and so they constantly watching you to see you, man, if you're going to do what you said you're going to do. And the same thing with the mother. She's saying, that, you know, I cook for him and I cook his favorite food and, you know, he likes this, he likes his oxtails and, you know, he, he likes his okra and tomato, you know, you know, and he likes his cornbread like this, you know, and there you are, you trying to figure out how to do that and, and mother is, is, is winning number one. Then we find ourselves putting a screen on the relationship because I don't really want to tolerate being around your parents. But he's, but one power. What do we do? What well, we're talking about a homecoming. Sometimes you visit when it's least expected. And they say, oh, I didn't know you was coming. Yes. And then you look at him and say, I love you too. Thank you for doing such a good job with my husband. Thank you. You know, he's such a good provider. Thank you for doing a good job with my wife. You know, she takes good care of me and she looks out for me and, and we look out for each other and she she encourages me and she tells me when I'm gonna be in a knucklehead. Thank you. Homecoming. Sometimes we have to bring things back home. We threw them away, but bring them back home. And you find out that the wife and the husband loves those things. I'm so glad you brought that home. I'm so glad you brought him by our house. I'm so glad you brought her to meet us. I'm so glad. But let, but let me just enlighten you just a little bit more on the homecoming aspect. See, homecoming means you or someone that you know is coming back home from where they left home, the comfortable environment where there's a lot of love and wholesomeness and tender care and people pay attention to you and you feel like I'm on top of the world. That's what home is all about. That's a homecoming. You know that when you get there, you're going to be welcome, that people are going to be happy to see you. Glory to God. Now, in order to get to the homecoming in heaven, you must experience a home going. Uh-oh. So in order to, the only way to get to heaven, yeah, you've got to die. You've got to return back to the spirit. Jesus is waiting on you. The homecoming is planned. Now, in the last days, the Lord tells us that's going to be a homecoming. That's going to be a home going. In the twinkling of an eye, that's going to be a, whoo, a homecoming. See, in the twinkling of an eye, you're going to be changed from mortal to immortality. Glory be to God. That's going to be awesome. That is going to be awesome. Are you preparing yourself for the transformation? Have you been doing the things that you ought to be doing? Are you listening to when God talks to you? When God tells you what to do and how to do it? God spoke to me the other day and I was going into a place of business and he said, uh, and the people were being so nice and I walked in there. And, and you see, you know that we all are struggling. But people don't know what you got until you reveal it to them. Then they still, they, you leave them thinking. And I walked into this place, and I ain't going to tell you where it was, because it really ain't none of your business, <laughs> okay? But I want to give you a little bit of my business so you know that how good God is. So I went into this place, and they was working, and I saw, you know, black ladies, you know, in there working, so black and white, and all of them was working. And I saw these two or three ladies that I knew, and they acknowledged that they knew me because they said, hey, Reverend Paul, how you doing? And it made me feel so good. I got in line and waited to my turn to be served. And when I walked out, the Lord told me, said, uh, and you know what God's speaking to you. He said, give her a tip. 
I walked that out. I tried to fall. I tried to do things very, you know, discreet. You know, I tried to just fall up and almost in a knot, keep folding until I fold up to where it just almost like a little dime, you know? And I walk out and I couldn't get the opportunity to give it to her. So I unfolded and put it back in my pocket. But as God would have it, I had an opportunity to go back by that same place again. When I walked into the place of business, they were busy and they were moving. And there were three or four ladies and they all was all working. And the first lady, she waited on me and I said, I just want just a little bit of ice, whatever. And she gave me the bag of ice. And I wanted to do something. I looked and I said, where was that one? Where is that lady that the Lord told me to bless? Because you know where your blessing is. And I glanced and she was behind the door and I waited and I waited there and I folded up a little knot. I asked the lady, can you give me a change? You know, they gave me some change. And I said, come here, come here. She came up and the other and then the other lady I told to tell her to come, she said, well, Pa, I want you. So she came to the door. I said, yeah, thank you for being so nice to me. Now, when I did that, the other lady that told her to come looked at me too. And the Lord said, now bless her too. Because before, when you leave, she gonna know that you told her, gave her something. So I said, this is for you. Thank you for being so nice. Now you can just imagine that. Now the other lady, the third lady, was three or four people down. I said, give this to her and tell her. And so she touched on the shoulder and said, Reverend Powell. She said, who? She said, Reverend Powell. I said, I wrote it and gave it to her. She said, thank you so much. Now she didn't really know who I was. But you can believe it that those other two was going to tell her who he is. My father is rich in houses and land. He said, I got a cattle on a thousand years. You know, when I was coming up, we didn't know we were broke. We didn't even know it was poor. I was talking to a brother the other day. I was talking about how we used to go, we play games outside. We didn't have all this Nintendo and stuff. We would take tires, car tires, and roll them. Like, and roll them. I get a tire, you get a tire, find you a tire, clean it up, and we roll tires. You can roll the tire the fastest, okay? Make the tires do stuff. Then, Lord help you, if you had a bicycle, your daddy taught you how to rebuild bicycles and you fix them up. And if you map now, and you got some skates for Christmas, oh Lord, we're talking about the good old uh, metal skates that, that you have to have some decent shoes. Now, them church shoes, or well, church shoes was awesome to skate in, but your mama half care you when you put them on. Because they would hit that little clamp with vice with the tie around that shoe. And boy, you can skate and put your little handkerchief or something in your back pocket. I put your scarf through your stick, let the wind blow you. You know, that was pl playing to us, interacting. We didn't have all this stuff that you can go in the house inside now and play. But, and, and the brother began to reflect and, and we, remind me of where I came from. How we would go outside and play with each other. Interaction is needed. Children have been missing interaction in school. And they found out that is one of the most healthiest things that little children can experience is interaction. And I would listen to people talk about the mask wearing. Children don't have a problem wearing a mask. It's the grown folks got a problem wearing a mask. Children can wear the mask to school with no problem. They don't complain because the mask only is... is, is, is 3% of their problem when they first get, then once they overcome that, they have no problem breathing or nothing else because they, they come there and they visualize and see and fantasize and use their mind with everything they're doing. But we, grown up adults, are the ones. Right now, 99% of the people are in the hospital they have never had their COVID shot, never had the shot. And now you see the lines backing up. People getting sick and sick. And I, I, I would listen to a lady that day say, well, hey, hey, I'm sick, you know, and, I, and I, I ain't had the shot, but I don't want to get the shot, and I don't want to be around nobody that got the shot. I'm like, what kind, what kind of analogy is that? I ain't never had the shot. I'm not going to get the shot. So I don't want to be around somebody that got the shot because I ain't never had the shot. I don't want you to infect me. Women, women that's kind of reverse, right? But people, and then one guy said, well, I ain't going to get the shot because uh, they can inject something in, through that needle into me or, or some type of chip. I don't know what a big old chip will get through a liberty needle hole, you know? But, but we have got to think about what we're saying before we say that. Think about it for a moment. If I'm not a scientist, then 
and I'm just a basic layman, how can I talk to you about science? Science, I don't know about it. If I'm not a doctor and the doctor's trying to tell you something, how are you going to tell the doctor what the doctor already knows? You think he's going to keep listening to you? No, he's not. You know? So we, we have to take a moment and thank God. I keep saying it's homecoming. It's time for us to come back home to bi basic Bible study, basic Bible reading, basic Bible understanding. Come on back home. Get your Bible. Read it. The Bible says such the scriptures, for in them we think we have eternal life. Such them, because there's always somebody going to give you their concept, their belief. But read it for yourself. Then can't nobody lie to you because you read it. And when you read it, comprehend it, understand it, can't nobody fool you. The word of God, the Bible said the word of God is so plain, a fool would not err. So, God bless you. Pray to my heart, see the beard of Jesus' feet. Thank you so much for listening to the broadcast once again. God bless you.